tēnā koutou te whānau, nā mahara mai ki te kōrero o te ahi kōnei. Tēnā koe e tā horangi, tēnā koe whaia, tēnā koe whaia, tēnā koutou katoa. Nō reira me timata tātou ki tēnei wāhanga o te hui, me te tahi karakia. Let us pray. He honore, he krori a ki te atua. He maunga rongo ki te whenua. He whakaaro pae ki ngā tangata katoa. Hanga e te atua he nā kauha ki roto ki tēnā, ki tēnā o mātou. Whakatongi a tau wairu a tapu hei awhina, hei tohu tohu i a mātou. Hei ako hoki ngā kupu i roto i tēnei mahi, i tēnei kōrero o te ahi ahi pō. Ake, 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 āmene. Tēnā rakoutou. Kia ora, Helen. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Nō mai heari mai ki te kura matatini ki o tāko. Ko una, tokoe koa. Welcome. My name is Erno. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive for Learning and Teaching Services, and it's my very great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to you all from all of us here at Otago Polytechnic. We are delighted that you have joined us on this very special occasion. Professor Federico Fresky's inaugural lecture. We are pleased to honor Federico and indeed privileged to share in this significant milestone with him. I'm going to give you a little background to our wonderful Professor Federico. Federico joined Otago Polytechnic in October 2019, so just two years ago, from the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, bringing to Alfano a wealth of international experience and expertise a deep understanding and appreciation of the arts in all their forms, and an impressive portfolio of contributions to international academe. Presentations, performances, keynote speeches, and myriad publications, academic journal papers, conference contributions, reviews, poetries, all numbering in excess of 100 at the very least, as well as the numerous book chapters he has authored, and books of which he is also co-editor, including the forthcoming publication with our Professor Jane Venus and Farida Nazia to be launched next month here at Otago Polytechnic, The Politics of Design, Privilege and Prejudice in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa. Federico's pra professional practice is equally rich and collaborative in its scope. He is an active member of several international arts associations, including the Arts Association of Australia and New Zealand, the American Committee of the College Art Association, the Association Internationale des Critiques d'Art, and the Arts Council of the African Studies Association. Between 2012 and 2016, he held the role of Vice President of the Board for the International Committee of Art History. As our Head of College of Te Mano, Pumanawa, the College of Creative Practice and Enterprise, Federico leads by example, drawing on his extensive learning and teaching practice in the arts. Formerly the Executive Dean, he led the Faculty of Art and Design and Architecture at the University of Johannesburg, successfully transforming learner outcomes, research capability and recognition, as well as integration of indigenous practice into the curriculum. During his tenure, he curated the first exhibition of the work of Matisse on the African continent. Such is his mana that Federico concurrently held the position of visiting Associate Professor in History of Arts at the Witt School of Arts for the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, where he had lectured and previously been head of school. Professor Freski is well-versed in the commercial and knowledge transfer domains of the arts, having been the executive lead and curator for the prestigious Goodman Gallery Cape in Cape Town, South Africa and also worked as a key consultant in human resources competency-based assessment techniques. Federico is a multidisciplinary arts practitioner as well as an academic. Many of you here will know him as an accomplished opera singer, and we at OP believe that he has set the singing standard for the Mihi Fakato, which is indeed hotly contested, I can assure you. He is also a creator of the Sartorial, 
Some of you here will have his pieces hanging in your closet or may be wearing them this evening. He is, indeed, a purveyor of exquisite interiors, including what can only be described as editorial felines. That's very posh pussycats. And fine dining experiences. Those who have had the pleasure of he and his partner Neil's hosted soirees can surely attest to this. Finally, Federico is a wonderful colleague who lives our values by empowering others, having the courage to challenge our thinking, caring for the people and programs in his college and in our wider community, and by always being accountable for that which he leads, collaborates on, and generously shares with others. We are indeed very fortunate to count him amongst our academic leadership team. It is then with very great pleasure that I ask Professor Federico Freschi to come forward and share his inaugural professorial lecture with us. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou, ko Johannesburg, te Turakawewe, i tipu ake o Springs, ke te noho o ki Otepoti. Ko itari rato ko poa ka iwi. Ko freski rato ko yuhu ko liuna ka whanau. Ko Federico Rawa ko ela ka matua. Ko au tēnei. Ko Federico freski toku ingoa. Nā reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Coming from afar to Aotearoa, New Zealand, I'm always moved by the pepe mihi, mihi mihi, and the sense of belonging that it seems to bestow to the speaker. To be able to say with certainty, ko o tene, this is who I am, by understanding oneself in relation to place and ancestors seems like an extraordinary gift, a sense of identity that is as irrevocable and certain as the mountains and rivers that sustained and succored your ancestors and without whom you wouldn't exist. For those of you who could follow my te reo, um, and thanks to Sean Taho for guiding me through my mihi and encouraging me to ensure that it comes from the heart, will have noticed that I named neither river nor mountain. This was partly because I'm the son of migrants, both of whom resisted acculturation into the place where they found themselves and whose self-identification was always elsewhere, with landscapes I never saw and family members I never knew. It is also because I was born and grew up in a town called Springs, which is located at the far east end of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. The highland of the Witwatersrand is a watershed approximately 100 kilometers long and 37 kilometers wide. And its rich gold deposits, first discovered in 1886, made South Africa the leading producer of gold well into the 20th century. The discovery of gold led to a massive gold rush and the city of Johannesburg mushroomed at the center of the Rand with towns to the east and the west and the tailing dumps of the mines extending the length of the ridge while lakes of water pumped from mines formed in its valleys. So the mountains and lakes that I grew up with were man-made. The forests planted by miners for the timber they needed in the mines and the water they needed for survival being pumped in from distant rivers. In short, it is a landscape constructed of greed and exploitation. Apart from its man-made elements, it is largely featureless, characterized by rolling grasslands and scrub. Like all the towns on the Rand, springs came into existence because of gold and coal mining and for its associated industries. And also, like all the other towns, springs attracted migrants seeking employment in pursuit of a better life. By the mid-1960s, when the gold was all but gone and the industry in decline, this included my parents. My father from the pristine alpine landscapes of northern Italy, my mother from the dramatic mountains and valleys of the Boerland in the Western Cape, where she could trace her ancestry to the French Huguenots who had arrived from Provence in the, 18, in the 1680s. This is where I grew up, surrounded by mine dumps, stagnant toxic lakes and the rusting detritus of a once thriving industry. The offspring of migrants never quite got over the shock of the place in which they found themselves and who, as soon as their children were grown up, fled to the gentler landscapes of the Cape. Thus, introducing myself was always somewhat fraught, the offering of a polysyllabic foreign sounding name, a surname that no one ever bothered to pronounce correctly, 
a bracing for the inevitable, but where are you from? I'm from here, I would have liked to have said, instead of shrinking embarrassedly from the question. <clears throat> a queer creature of the mine dumps and slurry dams, of abandoned factories and steam locomotives, of lower middle class suburbs and small ugly houses with aspirational lawns, of mean spirited entitled whiteness and self-serving conservatism. I'm from here. And it's a good place to come from because it's a good place to leave. Ko o tene. <laughs> I offer this lengthy mihi as it gives something of a personal context for the research questions that have occupied my career for the past two decades. From the outset, I've been interested in those aspects of visual culture that identify and weave together visual tropes and signifiers that encourage us to imagine a shared identity. Things like postage stamps and banknotes, travel posters, public monuments to foreign heroes, illustrations in history textbooks, but most of all, the decorative elements in public buildings. I grew up in a time when public buildings were still deliberately and self-consciously grand. Before governments began parceling up and selling off the responsibilities for the enrichment of the highest bidder, even the most modest of public buildings could boast a well-appointed entrance lobby with iconographic elements on their facades and interior decoration that resonated with the bureaucratic functions to which they were dedicated. From an early age, I was intrigued by the connections between the images of proteas, wild animals, <clears throat> so-called tribal black people, sailing ships and coats of arms, on postage stamps and, very occasionally, since I didn't see them very often, banknotes, and the decorative elements in and on the buildings that I saw when I accompanied my mother on her errands. Even then, I felt the seductive pull of their didactic intentions, as if they contained some kind of promise of a less alienated self. If only I could learn how to read the instructions. At the same time, and without wanting to imbue my preliterate self with the precocity beyond his years, I resisted this sententiousness. Even then, and although I didn't have the words to express it, I was skeptical about how something so layered, complex, multifarious, and personal as identity and belonging could be conveyed by a stock set of signifiers. And as I became subject to the indoctrinations and sophistries of apartheid education, I was left with a continually nagging set of questions. Whose history? Whose identity? Whose right to belong did these signifiers convey? Later, these questions would crystallize into what would eventually become my PhD, entitled The Politics of Ornament and the Body of Work that Flowed from It. The longer arc of this work is not concerned with the grand gesture of the public building itself, but rather with ornamental elements of adornment that allows to read into them constructs of nationhood or identity. Ornament may seem incidental, but it is never innocent or marginal. Ornament is where contradiction is revealed or resolved in ways that in themselves may be contradictory. It is the space where others, apart from the architect, namely artists and designers, become involved in establishing visual presence in our built environment. In ornament, I argue, we see a narrative of the past that is of the utmost importance in providing insight into the present, not least into the hard-baked privileges and prejudices, prejudices at the core of our societies that often remain hidden in plain sight. Which brings me to the title of this lecture, which is in fact the subtitle of a publication that is about to be released. Um, and I'm pleased to show you, hot off the press, literally Matt Galloway has just brought them to us, uh, the first sample copies, which you're welcome to look at. And of course, you will all be invited to launch where you'll be encouraged to purchase them. <laughs> so uh, about to be released, it's entitled The Politics of Design, Privilege and Prejudice in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia and South Africa, edited by Jane, Jane Venus, Farida Nazir from the University of Johannesburg and myself. The book began life while I was still at the University of Johannesburg as another book project entitled Designing Apartheid. As a highly deliberate system of institutionalized racism and segregation, apartheid permeated every aspect of South African political and cultural life. Its effects and continuing legacy were highly deliberate, all-encompassing, and systematically designed. Farida and I were interested in exploring what we saw as long overdue questions about the meaning of the design of apartheid. While much work has been done on apartheid architecture and urban planning, there is substantially less scholarship on apartheid design in relation to other forms of visual and material culture, and we were interested in filling that gap. 
Unfortunately, the publisher withdrew because of COVID-19 in April last year. When I mentioned this to Una and Leone, they suggested that the Open Research Office would be willing to take over the publication, especially with an expanded scope that included Aotearoa New Zealand. Professor Jane Venus kindly accepted the invitation to join the editorial team, and we expanded the theme and scope to include other settler colonial societies of the British Commonwealth in the Southern Hemisphere. In addition, in, in addition to contributing a chapter, Matt Galloway produced the elegant design, the indefatigable, indefatigable Pam McKinley wrangled an impressive cast of editorial assistants, and we're now looking forward to taking delivery of the book in a few days. I don't want to steal the thunder of the book soon to be announced launch, so I'll give the briefest of introductions. The politics of design takes a broad definition of design, exploring aspects of architecture, communication, design, technology, and film, amongst other subjects. These are united by an interest in the role of design in creating and perpetuating the privileges and prejudices of racial hierarchies. Indigenous voices from Aotearoa New Zealand and Australia are prominent, enabling a recovery of knowledge that was erased through colonial systems of integration and assimilation. In the current context of globalism, resurgent nationalism, culture wars and calls for decolonization, we believe that thinking comparatively across disparate but conceptually similar cultural and geographical contexts can go some way towards a new kind of restorative knowledge. In addition to being one of the editors, my own contribution to the book, which brings me back to the theme of this lecture, is a chapter entitled the Boeing's Great, the Going's Great, South African Airways, Apartheid, and the Technopolitics of Design. The chapter is something of a departure from my usual focus on visual culture, in that it is concerned with the politics of technology rather than the politics of ornament. This is partly because I've never quite outgrown my boyhood fascination with technologies of transport, particularly those locomotives, steamships, airliners, that conjure the nostalgia of a time when travel seemed alluring and romantic before the relentless march of neoliberalism and a shrinking world rendered it commonplace, often disappointing, and unconscious, unconscionably deleterious to the environment. South Africa's distance from the colonial metropoles of Europe, coupled with its strategic geographical importance and abundance of natural resources, meant that a great deal of effort has always gone into creating fast and re reliable land, sea, and air routes. Indeed, European settlement in South Africa came about because, because of the trade routes from Europe to the East Indies, first by Portuguese explorers who, although they never settled, established some vitaling spots around its coastline, then by the Dutch East India Company in the 17th century, followed by the British at the end of the 18th. In the late 19th century, Cecil John Rhodes envisioned a Cape to Cairo railway through British held ter territories across the continent, which in his flawed imperialistic logic would somehow render the Cape and South Africa more Mediterranean than African. Um, I've just included this brief timeline to give a sense for those, because I realize that I'm, I'm taking broad sweeps of South African history. I can hardly expect you to know <laughs> the detail of it. So just some of the key dates um, here, just to bear in mind. So from the, the late 19th century, the gold rush in the 1880s, to the Anglo-Boer War in 1899 to 1902, um, out of which the Union was formed, so that's the uh, former British colonies with the Boer Republics under the Crown. Um, successive governments after that with always the tensions between uh, nationalism and imperialism. Uh, coalition government formed in 1933, which I'll talk about more in a moment. In 1948, the Nationalist Party came to power and began implementing apartheid laws. Um, that led to the establishment of the Apartheid Republic in 1961. By 1976, resistance internationally and uh, domestically had grown really intense, and it's, it's best represented by the, the infamous Soweto uprising. Um, and then to 1994, which is, of course, the first democratic elections that brought into uh, being the current black majority government. So just bear, although I, there's a test afterwards, so just bear those, <laughs> bear those dates in mind. Um, so getting back to the theme of, of travel and the need to connect South Africa to the metropoles of the North. In 1952, Johannesburg famously initiated the Jet Age with the arrival from London of a BOAC de Havilland Comet, carrying the first fair-paying passengers in the world to travel on a commercial jet. 
South African Airways immediately became one of the earliest customers for the Comet, operating them on their profitable route between Johannesburg and London. <coughs> the airline's route network, international route network developed throughout the 1960s, despite an airspace ban enacted by the Organization of African Unity that barred South African Airways overflying or landing rights over much of the African continent. This ban necessitated an expensive and time-consuming detour around the bulge of West Africa. And because of the rerouting, South, Africa's, South African Airways flying time to its European destinations increased substantially. The airline thus worked closely with Boeing and other manufacturers to find technological solutions for its geopolitical requirements, a relationship that was lead to substantial innovations that contributed to these manufacturers' preeminence during and beyond the Cold War. South African Airways was, for example, and this is for the um, other techno nerds in the room, was the first airline to fly Boeing 707s with full span leading edge flaps that enabled additional lift for taking off in the high hot altitude conditions of Johannesburg and Windhoek airports. Pratt and Whitney designed long range engines in the 1970s specifically to meet South Africans' route requirements. The Kruger flaps that became standard on the leading edge of A300 Airbus aircraft were designed specifically for South African Airways. The ultra-long-range Boeing 747 SP, which stood for special performance, was designed partly to meet South African Airways' needs for non-stop, fuel-efficient, long-haul flights. And South African Airways was, of course, one of the first customers for this aircraft. In short, these technical developments, designed and paid for by the apartheid government, came ultimately to enable the benefits of ultra-long-haul aviation that we take for granted today. In my chapter, I argue that the complicity of these international suppliers and the benefits that accrued to them raise important questions about the morality of technological artifacts and the ways in which we continue to benefit from design that was originally sponsored in the name of oppressive political regimes. My excursion into technopolitics is a different take on the questions of identity and belonging that occupy the greater arc of my research but is nonetheless connected in terms of how it enables signifiers of modernity, progress, and national pride. While fast and reliable commercial aviation was strategically important in mitigating the country's geographical isolation, it had the arguably more important ideological role of enabling white South Africans to maintain links with the white metropoles of the Northern Hemisphere. Symbolically, this was enacted by a new livery of orange, white, and blue of the Republic's flag, incorporating indigenous plant and animal motifs into the interior design of the aircraft, and building new international style airports that proclaimed the modernity and sophistication of the apartheid state. <clears throat> Consider for a moment the image of Johannesburg and by extension South Africa that is conveyed in a couple of scenes from the director Peter R. Hunt's 1974 film Gold. Based on Wilbur Smith's 1970 novel Goldmine and set largely in Johannesburg, the film stars Roger Moore, who plays a character called Rodney or Rod Slater, who's a British manager of a South African mine and who falls in love with his boss's wife, Terry Steiner, played by Susanna York. So watch this for a bit. So just to describe for those, because um, this lecture is being live streamed and because of copyright issues, we can't um, show these images um, online. So I'll just tell you what you just saw. <laughs> so in that, in that scene that we've just seen, uh, Terry drops her husband, Manfred, who's played by Bradford Dillman, off at Jan Smuts Airport, which is now Ortamba International Airport. We see her cream-colored Mercedes-Benz convertible speeding up an elevated off-ramp as the camera pans to show the sculptural breeze delay of the International Terminal Building, while a voiceover airport announcement notes the delay of South African Airways flight from Athens and Nairobi. As the convertible pulls up to the departure hall, 
we hear another announcement, first in Afrikaans and then in English, of the imminent departure of a UTA French Airlines flight to Ilo de Sol and New York. In a later scene, which you're about to see, Terry and Manfred are once again at the airport, which is now decorated for Christmas. After a brief exchange at the UTA counter with a natalie dressed check-in officer, UTA's futuristic uniforms of the period were designed by André Courage, and a black porter, we see an establishing shot of a UTA DC-10. The airliner pushes back taxis and takes off in short order, while Terry stands at a public telephone booth counting down its progress to Rod. The airport announces voiceover names the destinations, the Seychelles, Colombo, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. As the camera pans to follow the climbing aircraft, the vertical stabilizer of a Lufthansa jet is briefly visible in the foreground. Cutting back to the terminal building, we see that Terry and Rod are in fact at the same bank of telephone booths. As they clasp hands and hurry smilingly to consummate their tryst, the camera lingers on a slowly revolving abstract sculpture in highly polished steel. Oops. Thus, the scene is set for an international romantic thriller that could be taking place anywhere in the Western world. Of course, there's no shortage of local color in the film. There's a protracted scene of black miners doing traditional dances, performing to racially segregated audience with white bosses and their wives on one side of the stadium and black miners and their families on the other. However, these are background elements. The foreground is a Johannesburg that is the prosperous, glamorous playground of white privilege. These scenes deftly convey the imaginary of a sophisticated, technologically advanced white South Africa, but a few innocuous signifiers that are effectively hidden in plain sight. The announcement of international destinations, even though in 1974, South African Airways would not have flown from Athens via Nairobi, and UTA did not fly to New York via Ilha de Sol, the latter was in fact South African Airways' route, the airline having contributed substantially to the construction of an airport on Seoul expressly for the purpose. The presence of European airliners in defiance of international sanctions, a terminal building full of fashionably dressed white people, the dramatic Brazilian-inspired modernism of the airport buildings, the interiors of which are decorated with sleek, sleek abstract artwork. The ostensible innocence of these things belie an immense and systematic program of image building on the part of the apartheid government, with architects, artists, and designers the unwitting accomplices. The artwork commissioned for public buildings in this period often conforms to a particular kind of lyrical abstraction, with rough textured finishes and abstract patterns and forms evoking the early 20th modernist, modern artists' interest in so-called primitive artistic forms from outside the West, as they struggled to find a new visual language to describe the disruptions of the modern age. 
During the 1960s and 70s, this latter-day primitivism became something of recurring theme among South African artists in the pursuit of an authentic, authentically South African form of modernism. In the context of the Brazilian-inspired modernist buildings, this self-conscious primitivism unwittingly becomes a further marker of the nationalist government's identity, at once forward-looking, sophisticated and urban, yet rooted atavistically to a particular cultural and social context. As I alluded to in my introduction, this tension between Western modernity and more primitive, authentic forms of identity has been something of recurring theme in constructions of South African identity. It is implicit in one of the first grand architectural gestures of nationhood, the Union Buildings in Pretoria, designed in 1910 by Herbert Baker to celebrate the unification under the British Crown of the former Boer Republics with the former British colonies uh, after the conclusion of the Second Anglo-Boer War. Under the sway of Cecil John Rhodes, Baker came to believe implicitly in the project of imperialism and the role of architecture in providing order analogous to that provided by colonial rule. Baker soon rose to prominence and was so influential in formalizing architectural practices of the day that the Baker School dominated South African architecture for the first decades of the 20th century. Informed on the one hand by his interest in the craft-based vernacular traditions of the Cape colonial style, and on the other by classical uh, architecture, Baker developed what has become known as the Union classical style. Inspired by Mediterranean architecture, this was an attempt to create a classically inspired style that was seen as appropriate both to climate and cultural context, but which, with hindsight, we can see was in fact an integral aspect of the imperialist imaginary exemplified by Rhodes as Cape to Cairo fantasy. This imaginary of the Mediterranean remains surprisingly persistent in South African architecture, informing endless speculative housing de developments in a faux Tuscan style and egregious neoclassical suburban homes. And yes, this is a real house in a <laughs> suburb in Johannesburg. Um, this uh, conflation of Cape colonial with Mediterranean references had a particular ideological resonance in the Union buildings, bestowing a politically expedient sense of regionalism to mollify the Africana component of the Union's constituency. Similar principles were applied in Baker's work with Edwin Lutyens for the imperial capital of New Delhi. Delhi has the same effect of classical monumentality, tempered with just enough regional flavor to naturalize it in the eyes of the local subjects. In effect, as Mark Crimson puts it, the indigenous references are pushed to the insignificant margins of the composition, where they are in no danger of destabilizing the grand narrative of imperialism, but rather participate calmly within it. Within the elaborate symbolism of the Union buildings, no provision was made for black South Africans, other than the open courtyard in which, as the architect put it, quote, the natives of the Union can experience the majesty of government, unquote, but without actually, of course, ever entering its hallowed halls. That these natives are now firmly entrenched in power is not only a sublime instance of poetic justice, but also a reminder of the fact that as societies change, the built environment is forced to express or reinforce different identities. In effect, and by a deft realignment of political and symbolic priorities, the notion of unity in the union buildings has been retained, but this time of the post-apartheid rainbow nation. In the 1930s, it, sorry, it is in the 1930s that Baker's particular blend of classicism and regionalism came into its own as the necessary condition of public buildings. Despite the devastating economic impact of the Great Depression and a prolonged drought, South Africa, as the world's leading producer of gold, experienced an economic boom during the 1930s with the concomitant rise in urbanization and industrialization. Politically, three agendas competed for dominance, Afrikaner nationalism at one extreme, with British imperialism on the other. The global financial crisis of the early 1930s prompted these political opposites into a new coalition government that gave rise to the centrist imaginary of what it meant to be a white South African, both imperialist and nationalist. Given the accelerated rate of urban development, landmark buildings came, became prime vehicles to promote an image of modernity. At the same time, it was politically expedient to couch this modernity in terms of the legitimating power of historical association. 
Of course, this selective appropriation or invention of history is a strategy of every new nationalism. In the fraught politics of the 1930s, this meant legitimating the claims of the so-called two races of South Africa to nationhood. Since this question of race, then as now, was a primary driver in South African politics, it's worth noting that the politics of race in the 1930s carried different associations than they do today. Given the racist attitudes of the time, black South Africans had no access to mainstream political life. The politically pertinent racial divide, rooted in bitter memories of the Anglo-Boer War, was therefore between the English and the Afrikaners, the two races. Although fusion was ratified in 1934, its arguments for a kind of unity and diversity had been well rehearsed since the beginning of the decade, and commissioning for public art, uh, commissions for public art were quick to respond to this. A noteworthy example is the elaborate decorative program of Herbert Baker's South Africa House, the home of the South African High Commission in London, which was a symbolic expression of the ostensible, ostensible desire for the unity of the two races under the new political dispensation. Baker originally conceived of South Africa House as having a Cape Dutch gable, uh, as you can see from the uh, projected drawing on the left. Um, but he was enjoined for reasons of visual coherence to design the building with an inset pediment in its place. At the level of detail, however, the classicism gives way to a wealth of decorative details that express notions of indigenousness, both in terms of representations of fauna and flora and in the use of South African materials for fittings and furnishings. The metaphor is extended to the gilded figure of a winged springbok, which appears throughout the building as a constant reminder of the leap of imagination required to effect what Baker termed, quote, the consummation of the fuller union of the two races, unquote. Despite Baker's principled objections to mural paintings, the High Commission insisted on the inclusion of artworks by South African artists. All of these artists went on to execute important commissions for public buildings in South Africa throughout the 1930s, and in so doing restated and amplified the themes first articulated in South Africa House. The various murals certainly reinforce what were to become standard tropes in the construction of white South African history, and indeed staple fodder for generations of school children to come. These are the European discovery of the subcontinent and the colonists', colonists so-called civilizing mission, the heroism of the pioneer settlers and the possibility of a peaceful and profitable coexistence of the two races. Master and servant dynamics are also very clearly spelled out. Black people are represented as an anonymous mass of barefoot, bare-chested men with women balancing baskets on their heads. There is a certain irony in the fact that despite being virtually invisible in mainstream, that is white, political affairs, the representation of the so-called native races is almost a necessary condition of the public art of the period. This I argues for two reasons. First, as with the representation of indigenous fauna and flora, the representation of ethnic blacks becomes a trope for the unique exoticism of the land and landscape. By the uneasy logic of the day, this in turn equates to notion of legitimate conquest and the right to land ownership by white settlers. Indeed, throughout the 1930s, the references to so-called native types in the decorative programs of public buildings were a way of claiming an authentic link with Africa. When combined with the self-conscious modernity of the Art Deco style, it made for a particularly heady construction of a colonial nation that had arrived and could assert itself in the modern world. In the context of these strict, stridently modern skyscrapers, uh, the image, images of black people are as much about appropriating an authentic African identity as they are about assigning ethnicity its rightful place. Black Africans are frozen in perpetuity in a stultifying tribalism, while white people are entitled to aspire to the world of modernity and international commerce. Fusion ended with South Africa's entry into Britain's war against Germany in 1940, and South African domestic politics were once again powerfully divided. While Prime Minister Jan Smuts waged war on Britain's behalf, conservative Afrikaners disavowed notions of national unity and accelerated their campaign for the creation of a white Afrikaner republic. As Afrikaner nationalism loomed ever larger in the 1940s, the comparatively benign construct of the joint destiny of the two races increasingly gave way to deeply racialized notions of Afrikaner dominance. And as the South African economy went from strength to strength in the post-Second World War period, its benefits overwhelmingly directed at the white minority, we see the rise 
of the imaginary of sophisticated internationalism so clearly captured in Peter Hunt's film. South African official architecture was dominated by this mode well into the 1980s. Indeed, in the dark days of successive states of emergency and with the country on the brink of a civil war, little of architectural value was sponsored by the state um, after the heady days of the establishment of the Republic. It was up to a new government after the transition to democracy in 1994 to reinvent the language of official architecture. Although the new government largely reappropriated the symbolic order of, uh, sorry, the symbolic order in terms of the buildings of the old regime and invented traditions to fit themselves newly hybridized by papering over the more odious reminders of the previous incarnations, there have been some exceptions. One of these is the Northern Cape Legislature in Kimberley, whose buildings make an impressive statement on the otherwise on an otherwise unremarkable urban landscape of a town that is perhaps better known for its absence of architecture, that is the infamous big hole uh, that was excavated for the diamond mining, than its presence. An essay in carefully considered formalism, the Northern Cape Legislature complex is characterized, characterized by sweeping curves and organic shapes, color to blend in with a dour landscape. In keeping with the brief to reflect both the natural and social diversity of the Northern Cape, Various elements that evoke the landscape and flora of the region were in incorporated as monumental coding devices. The extensive decorative program was conceived as integral to the design and reinforces the underlying rhetoric of a new kind of unity in diversity. These include the so-called hero's wall, as well as cut out steel and concrete heads, ostensibly representative of the diverse population of the region, which are scattered randomly throughout the indigenous gardens. Beyond the implicit appeal to a sense of genius low-key, the overwhelming effect of this architecture as art, like its colonial and apartheid-era uh, predecessors, is largely a triumph of style over substance. Run up as they were under political pressure in the first flush of early democracy, these legislature buildings beg some fundamental questions about how identities are constructed and manipulated to suit shifting ideologies. The new constitutional court in Johannesburg further complicates these arguments. It is located on a politically significant and historically fraught site, namely a prison that was the city's chief site of, site of incarceration until 1983 of political activists. Similar, symbolically, the project is informed by notions of transparency and rebuilding. In the courtroom, ribbon windows are positioned in such a way that the judges are aware of people walking past a literal interpretation of the notion of the man in the street whom the constitution serves. The incorporation into the new structures of some of the existing buildings and the use of salvage materials serves both as a literal statement of rebuilding and a metaphorical dialogue between past and present. A collection of artworks reinforces the importance of the individual voice over the more conventional approach of a didactic mural program. The references to an African identity are implied rather than explicitly stated. Primary amongst these is the notion of the tree as a metaphor both of place and community. A forest of angled piers in the lobby is a generalized interpretation of the Southern African tradition of dispensing justice from beneath a tree, with actual tree stumps serving as seats under wire chandeliers fashioned to look like leaves. Although these buildings clearly subscribe to the didactic potential of the public building as public art. This is somewhat constrained by a kind of self-conscious anti-monumentalism. In their ambition to be all things to all citizens, there's an earnest modesty about them. While this mitigates any potential for bombast, it also locates them in a very particular and somewhat politically naive historical moment. Nonetheless, they compellingly demonstrate the persistence of the role of art, architecture, and design in the construction of the national imaginary. I would also suggest that while the new grammar of subdued regionalism conflated with globalism may appeal to a broad audience, it also constitutes what Michael Billig calls banal nationalism. That is, an appeal to nationalism, nationalist sentiment that is neither obvious nor oppressive, and therefore more likely to lodge unnoticed in the popular imagination. Although I have focused in this lecture on examples from South Africa, I suggest that they have broad resonance across other former settler colonial societies. Against a global context of resurgent populist nationalism, urgent calls for decolonizing, 
and the rise of identity wars and identity politics, or culture wars and identity politics, I think it is also worth being mindful of the insidiousness of this banal nationalism and how it is conveyed through the designed and built environment. Indeed, one may well conclude with Michael Billig that, quote, if the future remains uncertain, we know the past history of nationalism, and that should be sufficient to encourage a habit of watchful suspicion. In the final analysis, the lessons of history are clear. Assumptions about cultural identity, no matter how inclusive, are never neutral. The imagined communities of nationalism and their representation in the visual arts are never permanent. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Thank you so much for being here this evening and for indulging me in this lecture. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora, kia ora, Professor Federico Freski. Me ki te honga katoa i hui hui mai ana ki konei. Kia ora, Federico, mo o kōrero whakamare me te whakairo nui. Ka mihi ki ka papatipu, runaka ki a Raiteuru. Ko Jean Loni taku whaia, ko Ian Loni toku papa. Ngā airihi me te kotarani ngā iwi. Ko Brady Loni toko ingoa, ko te whakahaere o te kura toi. I am Brady Loni of Irish and Scottish ancestry and the current head of the Dunedin School of Art. Federico, in this brief, thank you. Um, your talk is very relevant to us because of the links we can draw between all colonising countries, but particularly those associated with Britain. So I am very conscious of the... Um, vast Africana content of your lecture. For me, when I was reading your text initially, I found the appropriation of the visual culture of the people of the land, which occurs occasionally in your work, um, such a different focus from our own country here, where that occurs much earlier in our history. So it, considering the relevance of one colonised country, colonising country to another, to the, to the Commonwealth countries, to the impact of modernist architecture. Am I not talking to the microphone? <coughs> oh, it's sorry. <laughs> um, that's better. Um, we see vast differences and we see vast similarities. As colonists take control of the environment, what the visual culture does, what the architecture does um, of the, of the um, creation of a new national identity, a colonising identity that controls the use of land, controls the use of people, is it, as Federico makes so clear, it de develops an imaginary that is in fact invisible, that becomes naturalised, that is kind of impossible to see, but that informs the assumptions one makes about what should be so and what is so. Architecture, art, and um, all kinds of visual culture, interestingly, we have film, but Federico's barely mentioned advertising, which of course is now much more pervasive, but separate from art. These these insidious activists, activist sort of um, factors in our imaginary uh, 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 inform us from, the very, from our very childhood. It behoves us to make them explicit. Um, it's very important for us to, to, make, uh, to be conscious and to become conscious of the things that we take so much for granted. One, one kind of hilarious um, and really complicated aspect of Federico's talk was the implications of the development of long-haul flight. Who knew 
And those maps of the escape around the borders of the African continent of the airplanes are as uh, make an amazing image of the avoidance of what is going on in the colonizing environment. Thank you for bringing this knowledge to our community so that we can compare and for introducing yourself as a professor, Federico, using the frameworks in that beautiful introduction of location in place and context that acknowledge our bicultural understandings of how we position ourselves as the people within Aotearoa. Thank you very much. I think we do have time for a few questions, um, if Federico is happy to answer them. So if people have a question or two, I'm happy to pass the mic around. Yes, Nick. Uh, thank you for your um, thoughts, Federico. They were fascinating and um, <coughs> comprehensive. I wonder if I might move your attention uh, momentarily to Autopoti, uh, which is a different kind of um, imperial project designed in Scotland mm. and imposed on a um, landscape in a rather in un um, unsympathetic way. It's a different kind of imperial project, and I wonder if you've got any thoughts about um, the implications of, 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 that way, of that model of imperialism. Yes, a, a research question that I'm just starting to look at is um, the, some of the links, I think, that can be drawn in terms of uh, the language of classical architecture um, and... Johannesburg as a centre of the, the gold rush in the 1880s and uh, Otepoti Dunedin, the centre of the gold rush in the 1860s. Um, and how, you know, within a very small space of time, well, as you say, the Otepoti is sort of important from, Dun uh, from Edinburgh, uh, rather from Scotland, um, but immediately em em embraces that, that sort of very bombastic Renaissance classical style. Um, a similar thing happens in Johannesburg slightly later, um, sort of in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and interesting, just to get another technological first, um, Johannesburg is one of the first cities outside of Chicago to employ steel frame construction for multi-story buildings. Um, but I think the point that I'm making is that, that, yes, I am interested in those links between, I think it's, it's that, I suppose, that intersection of imperialism, the way that that identity is expressed through, a, in this context, a classical language of architecture, and how that comes to make claims for a kind of a permanence out of something that didn't exist, you know. I mean, that, that this land belonged to people who had who have no track with with Western European classicism. Um, and that overnight you could create the impression of a city that had been, you know, that, that to all intents and purposes had all the appurtenances of the global metro, the, the metropole. Um, and a similar thing that happens in Johannesburg. And so I'm interested in those kind of tensions, how these new cities claim permanence, use the, in this context, particular language of classicism. Uh, one of the big differences between Otepoti Danin and Johannesburg is that in Johannesburg this tradition persists. It's very interesting to see how um, an, a rising black middle class has embraced this language of classicism um, as uh, something aspirational. And that speaks to a different kind of aspiration than, you know, this, than an imperial one. But I think the, the core of that imaginary is the same. I think the tensions are very interesting to Con compare and, and tease out, but that at the root of it is, I think, what um, Ashilam Bembe refers to the ghost dances and slave spectacles that are at the foundation of a, a city's imagination. And we think, for me, those are really encapsulated in the classical architecture because they seem to evoke, in evoking the, the ancient language of the classical world and all of the embedded associations of permanence and authority and didacticism and so on. We mustn't lose sight that they come from sacred architecture and that initially there would have been temples. And somehow those ghost dances 
remain part of the language. And when we think of the, the monstrous exploitation of the settlers coming to places like Africa, Australasia, um, and just plundering the resources, riding roughshod over local populations, that idea of the ghost dances and the slave spectacles for me become really quite profound and affecting um, and linger as part of this, this memory in this architecture. So that was a very long answer to a, <laughs> a short question. Thanks for asking it. Any more questions? I think our uh, uh, breaks. <laughs> Are there many examples of um, architecture now in, in South Africa that reflect the apartheid era and the impact of that on the local population? Like, um, you know, we have museums and all that where the narrative is told, but are there, is there architecture that sort of embodies that or...? Well, the, um, I suppose there are two ways of answering it. So the one is to say, yes, there are buildings like the Apartheid Museum, for example, which is really the whole um, some symbolic program and iconog iconographic program of that building is designed to force one to reflect on Apartheid and what it meant and how it was enacted uh, through urban planning and everything else. Um, and places like the new constitutional court and new legislatures that sort of try to imbue, uh, bring a new language of design that is more inclusive. The other way to answer that is to say, well, obviously the the buildings that were built, you know, big buildings that were built in the 1960s, the um, local government offices and things like that, originally would all have had separate entrances, the stations, all those places you would have had your, your whites and your non-whites would have been separated, you know, with signage and the, the way that the, the, the treatment of the, the white entrances and the white parts of the buildings would be much, much more lavish, much more time and energy invested. It would have the, the more prominent and obvious route of access. Black entrances are always smaller and out of sight and you know, so somehow so those buildings still exist and there's just had to kind of, you know, it's just, as I say, the um, buildings have to kind of find new identities. They, they just become actors in this sort of ever-changing drama of, of political and national imagination. And some of those buildings, so the, those ghosts still linger, but the buildings have kind of become integrated. And then a lot of these buildings also just no longer fit for purpose. So there's a some you know extraordinary projects so for example the what was the administration buildings the government buildings in pretoria that were put up in the early 60s and you know magnificent i mean no expense spared uh, on a scale that is commensurate with the airport in terms of decorative programs and commissioning important artists and beautiful detailed building that building's now basically just you know being demolished by neglect um it's just i think and that's partly because as the epicenter of apartheid, it was not an attractive space for a new government to move into. And also just because it's no longer fit for purpose, you know, the buildings have a, a, a life span and require constant maintenance in order to exceed that lifespan. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, amazing talk, thank you. Um, I was just wondering whether the ghosts that you mentioned um, are more trapped in uh, the, uh, let's say, neoclassical sort of banks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would be an interesting project mm. for Danin and, 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 and Johannesburg, right? The banks. Yep. Uh, so in the neoclassical mm. buildings, public buildings, or they are uh, more or as trapped uh, in the new sort of uh, fake transparent uh, palaces uh, mm. uh, that we see, you know, sort of uh, being built, uh, you know, in the more, uh, let's say, in the new millennium, <laughs> let's call it that way. So, I mean, is it is it the transparency the new buildings of corporate power you know sort of like uh are are these is this architecture an architecture that tried to get rid of those 
ghosts, but in fact, uh, the ghosts manage to uh, get into those or, uh, or not? Or is it another form of a upper tide where we just like seclude the ghosts in the old buildings and the old temples? <laughs> I'm just wondering. Yeah, I love, I love that image, um, Cecilia. I'm just getting back to the banks. You know, uh, uh, one of the buildings that fascinates me in um, Otevoti is the old Bank of New Zealand building uh, on Princess Street. Uh, and of course, the, there's that uh, medallion above the entrance. Um, it sort of evokes the sort of the, the primitive uh, New Zealand. You know, it's all encased in this very elaborate Renaissance um, entablature. Um, so the ghosts there are very obvious and <laughs> obviously trapped, yeah. I think this, I mean, there, there's a, a big shift that happens, obviously. You know, Baradi alluded to um, advertising and that sort of the rise of, of media and uh, the increasingly mediated world that we live in. Buildings no longer have the same kind of functions that they once had, which is not to say that uh, this kind of landmarks uh, important significant architecture has not got any less uh, significant. But um, that kind of, so the way that it's, it's playing with other elements, with, uh, with elements of how buildings can respond to environmental imperatives and things like that, almost it seemed to be imposing a new kind of logic. So that's at the one extreme. And at the other extreme, it's just the, you know, just the, the high gloss and self-consciousness of neoliberal capitalism run amok. You know, and as, as governments increasingly try and offload, they don't want buildings because they, they're, they're expensive and difficult to run, you know, so just, and they don't actually seem to want anything. They want to offload everything to the private sector. Um, that obviously impacts on the way that, that buildings are going to keep going forward. But I think I, I love that concept of what happens to the ghosts in these, you know, glass skyscrapers. I think they remain trapped in the air chamber of the um, <laughs> of the, the windows, yeah, <laughs> of the double insulation, yeah. <laughs> mm. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have a question? Kati kati matatata kita mitunga o to tatau ahi ahi po te korero nei. Uh, kati ka kita faka mitunga me te tahi karakia. So let's join with our ghosts as we go into this evening. Let me just close this evening with a blessing, and then I will sing our blessing for the kai. Ki inoi tatau. Let us pray. Mate ara e kawe mai te nio, yara yara. Mate mara ma fakora ya koe wainga po. Mate ua e horoio maharahara. Mate hau e pupuhi te pa huka huka ki roto i tō tina nei. I roto i au hi koe tangitao, ki a whakaaro koe. Ki te humari a tā hua hoki o aura, mō ake tonu atu. Amen. Hei konei au, e te ariki, mana ki te amai e ne kai. Hei ora mō o te tīnana. Mō te mahi anō ki a koe. Āmenē. Kia ora mai tātou.